Now I'm going to shift gears, and uh, now that you understand the motivations and kind of the economics of why fuzzing is a good idea, we'll get a little more technical and talk about specific techniques and, and why it's a hard problem to solve. So the fundamental challenge of fuzzing is that it's an infinite space problem. For any piece of target software, you can generate an infinite number of bad inputs. And of course, nobody's got time, nobody's got infinite time to do their testing. So you need your fuzzer, your fuzz test tool, you need it to be smart about picking the inputs that are most likely to cause failures in the target software. I'm going to talk about three different techniques for for fuzzing from least effective to most effective. And this is important uh, both just so that you understand what our tool does and also uh, so that you understand uh, how to compare different products and understand uh, when people say, oh, I'm doing fuzzing, it doesn't always mean the same thing. The first technique, the easiest technique, is random fuzzing. And you can actually, you can write a random fuzzer yourself in five or six lines of Python or Ruby or whatever you want. Uh, but it's not going to do much for you. And the reason is, uh, well, so for example, if you're fuzzing a network protocol, what you would do is open up the port on your target and just pump random data at it. And it doesn't work very well because the data you're sending out doesn't look anything like real protocol messages. So the target will be receiving these random messages and looking at them and almost immediately discarding them because they don't look like anything. So graphically, it looks something like this. Um, if your target is on the right and it's got the bugs hiding inside of it and you're sending these random test cases, they just kind of bounce off the entry point of that software because they just get discarded right away. And it is true uh, that like the monkeys sitting at the typewriters, if you run a random fuzzer long enough, eventually it will randomly produce uh, something that looks like a real protocol message. And then maybe you'll do some effective testing and maybe you'll find a bug. But like the monkeys and the typewriters, it's going to be a very long wait. So this is a, not, a, not a very effective way of doing testing. The next step up from random fuzzing is called template fuzzing. Uh, it's sometimes called mutational fuzzing as well. What you do here is you get a recording of a successful conversation. If it's a network protocol, you use Wireshark or something like that, and you get a recording. And to do the fuzzing, you replay the recording over and over and over again. Each time you replay it, you mess it up somehow. You anomalize it. So maybe you flip a bit somewhere. Maybe you put in some extra data. Maybe you take some data out. But you anomalize it somehow and deliver it to the target and see what happens. It works a lot better than random fuzzing because the messages you're sending to your target look, for the most part, like real protocol messages. And that means that they will get accepted into the target, they will travel down some code pathways, and you're going to un uncover some bugs. So graphically, it looks like this, where the test cases go in, and you are going to uncover some bugs. However, Template fuzzing has some pretty important shortcomings. Uh, the first one is the testing that you're doing is only as good as the recording that you got in the first place. So if there are other messages in that protocol and you didn't get those messages in your recording, then you're never going to reach those parts of the code in the target to test them. Uh, also, the template fuzzer is just kind of blindly replaying this recording. So if your protocol that you're testing has checksums on messages or it has stateful features like session IDs, uh, the template fuzzer doesn't know anything about these and will not set those values correctly when the test cases go to the target. And this means that the target is likely to reject those messages or stop looking at them prematurely. The best kind of fuzzing is generational fuzzing. Uh, which is also called model-based fuzzing. And here, the fuzzer knows everything about the protocol or the file format that you're fuzzing. So if it's an HTTP fuzzer, it's been implemented from the HTTP specifications, and the fuzzer knows every possible message type. 
It knows every field of every message. It knows the rules about how messages are exchanged in this protocol. And that means, basically, that the fuzzer looks very legitimate to the target. And that allows the test cases to penetrate furthest and uh, are most likely to cause failures in the target. So graphically, um, the fuzzer knows the protocol. So it can create a whole bunch of test cases for the first field and the first message, and the second field and the first message. And it can just iterate through the model of the protocol that it has, creating test cases for each field of each message, which allows it to get really good coverage on the target. And in addition, because it knows the protocol, it can uh, set message checksums correctly. It can do the right thing with stateful features like session IDs and things like that. And so basically, it looks very legitimate to the target and allows the test cases to be as effective as they can be. This is a really interesting comparison of fuzzing uh, done on a single target. So we had this network filer, and we ran a template fuzzer on it and a generational fuzzer on it. And the template fuzzer ran for 118 hours and in that time delivered 10 million test cases and uncovered four vulnerabilities altogether. The generational fuzzer, the fuzzer that knew the protocol in question, by contrast, ran for 17 hours, delivered 200,000 test cases, and located 10 vulnerabilities altogether. So this is not uh, scientific. It, it's one set of test results. But it shows it's typical. Uh, and it shows you that the generational fuzzer gives you the best bang for your buck. So uh, you can always expect a generational fuzzer to find you more vulnerabilities in less time than a template fuzzer. But the other interesting thing about these results is that the template fuzzer actually found two bugs that the generational fuzzer didn't. And that just goes back to fuzzing being an infinite space problem, where these different kinds of fuzzers work differently choose different sets of inputs, different test cases to send to the target. And so they did uncover slightly different uh, vulnerabilities. The workflow when you're doing fuzzing, if you're going to sit down and fuzz something, uh, this is the workflow, the basic workflow that you would follow. So the first step is always uh, configuration, getting things set up. So you want to configure your target so that it's able to communicate with the fuzzer. And you want to configure your fuzzer so it knows where to find the target. Basically, you're aiming the fuzzer at the target. And usually, you just need to enter uh, an address of some kind so that the fuzzer knows where the target is. The second step is critically important. This is interoperability testing. And what you're doing here is no fuzzing. Uh, you're just sending valid messages from the fuzzer to the target and looking for valid responses. So you're really just checking to see that everything's hooked up correctly and that you can communicate effectively between the fuzzer and the target. And if that succeeds, then you move on and it's pretty much standard QA from there on out. So you have the fuzzer deliver all the test cases to the target. While you're delivering test cases, the fuzzer is monitoring the target to see if it's still healthy or if some kind of failure has occurred. Uh, and then when you're all done, you look at the results. Um, and if you've located vulnerabilities, uh, you remediate. You communicate those back to your development team or back to your vendor, whoever's responsible for that code. Uh, and then as soon as you get a new version of that uh, software or a new revision of that device, you repeat the process again. Thank you for watching these videos. We hope you've enjoyed them. If you want to learn more about fuzz testing, visit our website at www.codenomicon.com.